Hello, everyone, and welcome to BigML's 2016 Spring Webinar. Now, you may not be aware, but we are continuously deploying new features to the BigML platform. And once every quarter or so, we put together a webinar like this one to highlight the most significant changes. And there have actually been quite a few lately, and of course, there's, there's more to come. However, for this webinar, we're going to focus on a single major feature called WizML. We're focusing solely on WizML because it is a truly significant advancement in the capability of the BigML platform. In fact, we've been working on this new feature for the last two years or so, and it is an important step in the long-term vision of our machine learning service. To understand why, let's, let's step back for a minute and look at the promise of machine learning, what it is that people hope machine learning will do for them. So the idea is that you, you have data, probably a lot of data, but what you really want is insights, right? How can you redu reduce the churn and keep more of your customers? How can you increase the conversion of your leads into sales? How can you make better medical diagnosis? How can you detect and reduce fraud? Or whatever the domain of your data lends itself to. The important thing is that you have lots of this data, more than can be reasonably analyzed with traditional statistics. And therefore, the tool that will get you to the insights you want is machine learning. Now, of course, this sounds great, but there's more to the story. Once you really sit down and start trying to apply machine learning in practice, you're likely to find several hurdles. First, there's hundreds of algorithms. Which ones should you use? Even if you've got a pretty good handle on those algorithms, how are you going to scale them to handle massive data? For that matter, how will you deal with real data, mixed data types, missing values, unstressed data that isn't that clean? And even when you have a handle on that, how will you tune the algorithm for the best performance? If it happens to have any parameters, how will you select them so that the model performs the absolute best it can? And the most important thing in here is how will you automate all of those choices? And this last point about automation is really important because the value of your data is often time sensitive. For example, if you're collecting data on user behavior, it's not going to be as useful six, six months from now as it is in the next five minutes. You know, imagine if you're trying to predict if somebody's about to leave your website. So to get the maximum value from your data, you need to get insights from it as quickly and as frequently as possible. And the only way to do that efficiently is to automate the process. Now, we've had this vision of machine learning since the beginning, and the need for automation has always been a top priority for us. So let's just consider that first hurdle for a minute. Which algorithms do you use? And the approach that we took is that we looked at the field of algorithms and we carefully selected only the best ones. The ones that are proven performers can handle real data, can be made to scale easily, and interpretable, that means you can understand how they work, and exportable, they're very easy to put into production and make use of them. These features are really important because the dirty secret of machine learning is that the largest improvements in accuracy are more often from feature engineering and model tuning rather than selecting different algorithms. Right? So if you're spending your time worrying about what algorithm you're going to use, that's not time well spent. What about the other hurdles? Let's look at how BigML has addressed the rest of the hurdles in the development of our platform. So to handle scaling, we actually created a tool called Sauron, which transparently handles the allocation of resources for machine learning tasks. Then we created the world's first complete machine learning REST API, providing a clean programmatic layer to performing machine learning on top of our automated infrastructure. And then to handle real world data, we created a domain specific language called Flatline, which can be used to clean, filter, and transform data quickly and efficiently. This ability to do programmatic feature engineering is very powerful. So with those three components, it's already possible with BigML to create automated workflows and even write code that tunes models, for example, 
by programming against the API. Right? You could just create your own program in Python and integrate with our API, and you could you can do all the automation. But of course, this still requires a human to write those programs, and this is supposed to be machine learning, right? So the vision is to make it easy to go from data to insights, and this requires that we remove all of these hurdles. And so today we're releasing the next step in this vision, WizML. WizML makes it possible to write and share workflows, making it possible to abstract the complexity of these workflows into reusable executions. So now these higher level tasks like model selection and tuning can become fully automated as well, making it possible to completely remove the need for human interaction in the path going from data to insights. And we're not talking about vaporware here. We're, we actually are releasing this today. It's, it's live in production. And part of the release is a script called Smackdown, which can already do this type of automatic parameter selection. All right, so to make this a little bit more concrete, let's start by explaining what I mean by a workflow. So a workflow is composed of resources that are connected together to perform a specific task. Now here's a rough map of how the current BigML resources can be connected together to create a workflow. So if you, and this will all be very familiar if you've worked with BigML before, but we have the very first step is the source. This is where you bring data into the platform. And then from the source, you create a data set, which is a summarized view of your data. That's the first time we analyze all the fields, look for errors, missing values, that kind of thing. And the data sets are the fundamental building blocks for the rest of the workflows. So you can go, you can move into the upper left there, where you're doing modeling with decision trees or forests or logistic regression. You can move into the upper right-hand side of that map where you're doing unsupervised tasks like clustering, anomaly detection, or association discovery. In the lower right-hand side there from the data set, you can start doing just data discovery where you can run statistical tests or correlations, looking for patterns in your data. And of course, the immediate right side there, we have all of our batch outputs. So you can build a model and you can run a data set through it and you can use that to create a new data set. All right, so that's why that arrow goes both directions. Data into the batch processes and data sets come back out. And then down at the bottom, of course, we have our flatline editor, which allows you to do these programmatic transformations, creating new features or filtering or cleaning your data programmatically. So let's look at some examples of workflows. So first, a very simple workflow would be the original and only workflow that BigML supported many years ago. You would start with your source. You would use that to create your data set. The data set you would then model. And then now you can use the model to make predictions. And when we, day one when we launched, this was the workflow that we had. Now, of course, in the real world, it's unusual to have such a simple workflow. It's certainly possible, but it's pretty rare and would typically only happen when you have a very well understood domain and very, very clean data. So let's, here, here's an actual real world workflow that, that I created for finding real estate deals that we're actually going to demo in a future training webinar. And the basic idea is to make a model which can predict the sale price of a home and then use this model to look for deals among all the houses that are currently for sale. All right, it does this by taking the model and running all the houses that are currently listed for sale through a creative batch prediction, and then it computes the, on the output side, it tells you the difference between the predicted price and the list price. And as you can see, we're starting with two separate sources, and we immediately have to do some filtering, and there's some feature engineering before we even get to the modeling. And then even at the output side, we have to do some post-processing using feature engineering to get the final result that we're interested in. And you can imagine that if you wanted to rerun this workflow with different cities, you would, you would want this to be automated, right? You're not going to want to go through this multi-step process by hand every time. Of course, you might try writing a script, but in a future training session, we'll show you how WizML can solve this exact workflow. So let's take a look at workflows for tuning. Although BigML has already called the field of algorithms for doing modeling to provide the best that are available, we do still have a few that you can choose from, right? There's this idea of model versus an ensemble, and even in the ensemble space, you can do bagging or random forest, 
and you can even do a logistic regression. And it is possible, depending on your data, that one of these will perform better than the others. In fact, it's, it's, it's very likely. So what if you just wanted to know, in the big ML space, which one works best for your particular data problem? Well, what we could do is we could automate this by just trying them all and then using an algorithm to choose the one that performs the best. And so you can kind of see in this workflow, that's what we're doing. We take a source, we use it to create our data set, we split it into a training and test, then we just use the training set to build all the possible models. We build a model, we build an ensemble, do the logistic regression, evaluate them all, and then have, as part of our workflow, a selection process that chooses which model performed the best on our evaluation. Well, let's assume that we, we discovered that the ensemble performed the best. Well, we can actually go a little deeper into this, this line of thinking and say, well, can we tune that ensemble? And, of course, the answer is yes, right? Because one thing we can control is how many models are in the ensemble. Do I want to use 10? Do I want to use 100? Do I want to use 500? And that will impact the quality of the model. So we could do a similar workflow to automate the tuning. We take our source, take our data set, we split it, and now we just try bigger and bigger ensembles. And we keep increasing the size until the, the performance of the evaluation doesn't significantly improve. And then we've now selected the optimum number of models in our ensemble for our particular data. Now we could extend this idea to even more parameters, right? There's lots of other things you can do in an ensemble. You can not only ask how many models should I have in the ensemble, but you can even say, okay, for each model that I build, how many nodes should I allow? Do I keep the trees small and compact, or do I let them uh, split much more aggressively? And speaking of splits, do you want the trees to allow for missing splits or not? This is a feature we have where the tree can consider missing data as a signal, so it can actually create splits on missing data. If you're doing a random forest, you could, you could tune the number of random candidates, right? So at each split, you're choosing the number of features that you're going to consider for that split, and that's a, a parameter that you can tune. And you can even tune whether or not you want to balance the objective, right? Do we, do we have unbalanced classes? Do we just let it run? Do we balance the objective? Maybe you want to add weights, all right? These are all parameters that we can tune that are going to change the performance of our ensemble. And this, what I've just described, is basically what SmackDown will do for you. You can uh, provide it with a data set and a list of parameters that you want it to tune for building, say, an ensemble. And it will do a very efficient search to find the optimum set of parameters for that ensemble. So it'll tell you exactly how many models to use, how many nodes, whether or not to use missing splits, et cetera. So it fully automates this process of choosing the optimum parameters. So there's another way that we can think about model tuning, and this is more on the feature side. That is feature selection. So the idea is that sometimes the features in your data set don't actually help your model perform better. In fact, sometimes you have features that are just adding noise, and the model may actually perform worse when they're there. And so when that happens, it's often the case that a smaller set of the features will perform better than trying to use them all. But how do you know which features to use? Well, an algorithm can tell you, and there, there's quite a few, and one that we've already implemented is in WISML is called the best first feature selection. And I know the icons are getting really small, but this is, this is a multi-step process and it builds a lot of resources. So I'll take it from the top and move down to kind of give you an idea. But basically, we take the source, we split it, sort of like we've done all these other examples, and then we further split that training set into a family of data sets, each essentially containing only one feature. And then we use this single feature to build a model and evaluate it. And then the best evaluation tells us which of the features we want to keep. That is, it tells us which feature by itself did the best in the evaluation. And we take that feature and we set it aside and say, okay, well, I can see I'm choosing the best that was feature A, that was the one that performed the best, so I'm going to keep that feature. Right? This is best first. And then we repeat. So now we don't consider feature A, we use it for the modeling, but we don't uh, combine it. We go through and we build up new data sets, we build, train new models, and you notice there's one less feature there because we held one out. And then we choose the best again, and now we have a new feature set that's feature A and feature B. And we repeat again if we like feature A, feature B, and feature C. And we can, we can either set a limit and say, just give me the top 10 features, or we could change this algorithm and have it search for 
the uh, sort of optimum number of best first features, again, by looking for uh, when the quality of the evaluations isn't significantly improving, and we could actually extend that idea and add a penalty on the number of features as well. So we could discourage having too many features in that uh, equation where we decide how many to keep. So you can see that this is a very involved algorithm. There's a lot of resources being created. And it's the, the thing that's really important about it, though is that once it's been automated, it becomes reusable. Right? This becomes something that I can do just as an experiment. I can take a new data set that I've never modeled before, and I can run a best first feature analysis on it and find out what subset of features perform the best. All right, so this is a very, if we can abstract this concept into a nice atomic execution unit, it becomes something that's very powerful and easy to reuse. And finally, it's also possible to use workflows to create even higher level machine learning algorithms using the existing big ML resources. So, for example, a popular technique is called stacked generalization, or sometimes just stacking. And here the idea is you just train multiple models. All right, so rather than choose one, I take my source, I build my data set, and then I just use that same data set to build a model, build an ensemble, maybe do both bagging and a random forest, and maybe I build a logistic regression too. And then use all of those models to create a batch prediction, right? And once I have that batch prediction, I know which ones that model got right or wrong. And I essentially extend my original data set with the outputs of each of those models. And then I build another model, sort of a meta model, if you will, that takes all of the original data set features plus the predicted outcomes of the individual models to decide the final outcome. You can sort of imagine that that last model in some way is sort of choosing which model is performing better based on the, the input space of the features. And this is, a, this is, it seems like cheating, uh, but this is actually quite often effective on real world data. It's, for example, a very popular technique in Kaggle uh, and is a great example of a higher level machine learning algorithm that you can build with a big ML workflow. So, of course, there's lots of other examples, and a few of those are any of the boosting algorithms, right? These are a little harder to di diagram, so I didn't try, but the basic idea for all of them is to create a series of models tweaking each one or the ensemble as a whole based on the performance of the previous one. So you're basically building up a family of models and tuning each one uh, so that the performance is always improving. And we actually have already implemented gradient boosting as a, a WISML script and that will be available as well. All right, so where are we going with all this? Well, what we've seen is that machine learning is iterative by nature. Even if I'm just doing a simple data analysis, there's going to be multiple steps, right? I'm, I'm going to need to try some feature engineering. I'm going to need to try different models. I might have to do some tuning. It's a very iterative process, even if you have a pretty clear picture of what you want to do. And without automation, those repetitive steps require you to focus more on the process rather than on getting the insights, meaning that your analysts are wrestling with all of the implementation details instead of getting the insights they want quickly. And also, it's easy to overlook the fact that not everybody can implement these complex workflows, like gradient boosting, for example. But once it has been created, many people can use it. This means that over time, the capability of the platform grows as people use it and share these workflows. And so this, by having a platform that allows you to share workflows, you are abstracting away the complexity of this automation, and essentially every day it becomes more powerful. All right, well, that was a lot of uh, high-level motivation for the need for workflows. So let's, let's actually look at what WISML is specifically and how it makes workflows possible. So first, a very simple definition. WISML is a domain-specific language for automating machine learning workflows. And in fact, WISML is a complete language with the common elements you would expect. Variables, data structures, conditionals, mathematic functions, etc. Now, there's lots of languages. 
So it would be silly if that's all we had done was create a new language. The, the important thing is that WizML has the machine learning operations are first-class citizens in WizML. That is, it's not just another language. It also has native calls to create sources and data sets and models and ensembles. Okay, so you have a full programming language, plus you have primitives to do machine learning tasks. And of course, the scaling is handled for you, right? If you were running uh, in a local tool, you would have to be concerned about the resources, how many machines you had, how much memory. And that's not the case here. There's no need to worry about that because it's all handled for you. And in fact, WizML understands the limitations of your subscription and can parallelize tasks for you automatically. And then finally, like all big ML resources, WizML was exposed through our API first, meaning that everything is composable. This is an important design choice that we adhere to rigorously. That is, all the big, big ML machine learning resources, algorithms, etc., we implement in our, and bring to our API first. This ensures that our API is always robust and fully featured and that all big ML resources can be automated. Right, well, now that we're talking about WizML related API resources, what are they? So the first is the script resource. And a script is the written expression of a workflow, right? It defines the inputs required to run the workflow and also the outputs. So this is what you probably imagine when you think about writing a script for automating a task. That is the WizML script API resource. But then we also have something called a library. And a library is very similar to a script, but it doesn't specify inputs or outputs, right? Rather, a library contains WizML code that could be included into other scripts. So this makes it easy to abstract these reusable ideas and avoid duplication, right? So I can start building up layers of abstraction in my libraries and my scripts become much easier and much more powerful. And then finally, there's an execution resource type. And this specifies a script and a given set of inputs. And then the execution is well, it's executed, and this will generate the script outputs and store the results into the execution resource as well. Okay, but like every, all our big ML resources, this becomes an immutable object, so you can see the history of the execution you ran, you can see which script you used, what inputs you used, and what all of the output, uh, what all the results were. All right, since we bring features to our API first, Let's take an, a look at an API example of WizML. But before we look at this API example, we need to explain a little notation first. For the following example to work, we of course need to have the appropriate environment settings, the username, the API key, and the authentication string loaded. And we're also going to use, or just show you, two very nice command line tools. The first is called HTTPy. Uh, and this makes it really easy to execute these REST API calls from the command line. And because our API takes JSON right in the in the body and returns JSON as the output, we're going to use a little tool called JQ to parse the API output and extract values nicely on the command line. All right, so let's walk through an example of creating and using WizML resources via the API. All right, so in this first step, we're actually creating a library. So we're making a call to the REST API endpoint to create a library, and we're passing it source code. All right, and the source code is defining a function called addition, which takes input two inputs, A and B, and it returns their sum. And when we execute this library creation, what we get back is the canonical identifier for this new library we created. So you can see that we get back library and then that, that uh, hexadecimal string. Okay, now we can create a script by calling the script endpoint, and we're going to pass it a list of libraries to include in the script. And so in this particular example, we're including the identifier for the library we just created. And then we put the source code for the script in here. And in this case, we're calling the addition function, which is defined in the library, with two values, x, which is going to be another variable, and two. So our script is going to call the addition function with whatever you pass it in as the value of x, and it's always going to add 2. All right? And the third line on there 
is defining the inputs. Okay, so this is telling WizML what the inputs to the script are and what kind of values to expect there. So we can see that X is an input and WizML should expect a number for that. So if we run this script, it's going to ask you for that value. And again, it returns us the canonical identifier for the script. And now we can create an execution. So we call the execution endpoint. We pass it the identifier of the script we want it to, uh, to execute. And of course, we need to provide it the input. So we told it to expect an input of x. Uh, and so in this case, we're defining the value of x to be 5. And what we get back is a canonical identifier for this particular execution. This is an asynchronous process. So you can imagine if this was a much more complicated example, this could run for a long time, or might run for a long time. And so we get a response immediately with the identifier, and that process is actually running, which means if we now fetch this resource, we can see if it has a result yet. And so in this, in this last step, I'm fetching the execution resource and checking the result value uh, in the JSON that comes back. And in this case, you can see the value comes back as 7, because if you roll this all the way back, we created an execution where we passed in a value of x equals 5, to our script, which takes the value of x plus 2, uh, or sorry, which calls the addition function from the library with those two inputs, which is 5 plus 2, and we get 7. Now, obviously, this is a very simple example just meant to show you how these three endpoints work together to create libraries, scripts, and executions in the WizML programming language. All right. Now, of course, you're more likely to prefer interacting with the API using one of our many bindings that are available. And so here we actually see the previous API example of creating a library source and execution, but using Python instead. So you can see it looks very similar. We connect to the API, we create the library, passing the same definition, we create the script. We have to have, a, this, again, this is asynchronous, we have to have a, a couple of API OKs in there just to make sure that we don't proceed before the resource is ready. And then at the end, we print the execution result. All right. And as, as part of the WizML release, we've already updated the Python, Node.js, Swift, and Objective-C bindings. So those bindings are ready to make full use of WizML as of today. OK, now, of course, like all the other big ML resources, once WizML was available in the API, our UI team went to work building up some really powerful features in the user interface. So first up, if you're not quite ready to write your own scripts or libraries, you'll be happy to know that it is quite easy to import existing scripts. So you can shop through the gallery and look for scripts that other people have written and shared. And if you find something that you need, it can be imported into your own account, ready to be used with a simple click. All right, so this now makes it possible for people who like writing scripts to share them and also makes it very easy as a consumer of scripts to find ones that perform complicated tasks that you're not ready to write. And of course, we've already shared several in the uh, gallery, which I will show you. you. It's also possible to import directly from a GitHub repository or a gist. So this makes it really easy for teams to develop a WizML script with full revision control and still be able to share and import these quickly into BigML. We make extensive use of this ourselves, for example. And there is already a BigML provided GitHub repository, one that we maintain, uh, with lots of examples preloaded in there. And I'll, I will show you that as well. All right, in terms of just interacting with WizML and the UI, you're going to find the, uh, the new menu item on the far right-hand side of the dashboard. Right, so we've got all of the resources in that dark blue bar, and on the far end there's one called scripts, and that's where you'll find the links to the scripts, libraries, and executions. And uh, if you're ready to code your own WizML scripts or libraries, this is also where you will find the script editor. When you go into scripts, you can create new ones in there. The script editor uses a lexer, and it renders these WizML scripts beautifully, making it really easy to avoid typos. Even better, the editor features a completion function, which automatically looks up the valid WizML commands. Okay, so you have a somewhat interactive environment that's helping you know, guide you through the language or remind you uh, what, what functions are available. And when you're done coding in here, the editor includes a validate button, which actually compiles the script 
to detect the inputs and outputs automatically, and then it provides you with entry boxes where you can specify the types for each input. And of course, the validation helps you to ensure that there are no errors, right? So it'll actually give you a report saying, hey, there's an error on line three, column 54, and you can find the typos very easy that way. Now that's still kind of a one shot, right? It's, it's a pretty rare programmer that types out the whole function, hits validate, and, uh, gets a win, and uh, saves it. So it's often nice to have an interactive shell for debugging. And for this, we've actually created a, a REPL, which makes it very easy to just experiment with the WSML programming language interactively, right? So you can play around with the syntax, uh, experiment with a little code change, and we're actually going to open source this code, so you should be able to run this in your local environment as well, which will make it much easier to just experiment with WSML as a language. All right, and the, the final way to create WSML scripts is called the Rayifier, although it's not quite ready yet. It is coming. Now, the Rayifier is something that we added to BigMLer last year, and the way it works is that you can point it at any resource that you have created in BigML, and it will generate the script which repeats the steps that you performed to create that resource. Right, so if, if, I create a, if I take a source, I make a data set, and build a model, and point Rayifier at the model, it'll actually build a Python script, that's the, how the Rayifier and BigMLer works, um, that creates the source, creates the data set, creates the model. So it basically writes the, auto, the script that does the automation for you. And this, this is possible because the resources in BigML are immutable, you know, except for their metadata, like their description, things like that. And they contain all of the information about how it was created, right? Every resource you use to create the new resource, plus all the parameters and everything else, are codified in the resource itself. And so the reifier traces backwards through all the resources that led up to the one that you want to reify. And this will be available for WSML. You'll be able to do rapid prototyping in the UI, which is a much easier environment to do experimentation. And then with the click of a button, you'll be able to automatically generate a WSML script that repeats whatever workflow you just prototyped in the UI. Right, so this, this sort of brings you full circle. Now you can rapid prototype in the UI, which is nice and easy, but then you can switch over to automated workflows very, very easily. Okay, so once you've created a WSML script, you have several options for sharing it. So for a private way to share WSML, you can use secret links like many of the other big ML resources. So once you enable it, it generates a little secret URL, and anyone you share that URL with will be able to use your script. Of course, you can also share in the gallery. Scripts and libraries can be shared in the gallery. And when sharing in the gallery, you have the option to share it freely, or if you are so inclined, to charge a price for people to clone that resource, right? So you can actually start your own side business making these WSML scripts if you like. You also can choose a license, or you can write your own to control the terms of use. And then it's important to keep in mind with all these ways to import WSML scripts that it is possible to write the equivalent of malware, okay? Something that deletes the resources in your account or shares private data. And so to ensure the safety and quality of WSML scripts and libraries that are shared in the gallery, your resource will first be reviewed by BigML before it's listed publicly. So you actually get a little note that says, you know, thanks for your submission, and we'll let you know when it's been approved, and then we actually will look at the code and make sure that it isn't doing anything nefarious. So that way, when you're looking through the gallery, you know that all the scripts listed there have been through this review process. And finally, however you get your script, whether you get it in the gallery or write your own or bring it in from GitHub, you can actually define your own one-click menus in the UI. What does that mean? Well, it means you can take these workflows and you can add them directly into the user interface. You can essentially customize the BigML dashboard with the workflows that you run the most often. All right, so let's, let's switch over to a demo. And I'm going to be using, just for quick execution, I'm going to use 
this very simple data set, this is real data, it's from the UCI repository, and it's called the diabetes data set, and has some various diagnostic measurements for patients, like their number of times they've been pregnant, their four-hour plasma glucose, these kinds of things, and then has a field that marks whether or not that patient had diabetes. And from a predictive analytic standpoint, the idea is to build a model that based on all these easy to measure diagnostic measurements that predicts whether or not somebody has diabetes. All right, and so let's let's pretend that I'm playing, starting to play with this data set, and I don't want to use all eight features. I just want to know what the two best features are, perhaps. All right, and I, I've just heard about this best first feature selection. I'd like to try it out. Okay, but I don't want to code that. So what we'll do is we'll go out to the gallery, and we'll see if somebody has implemented a best first feature selection. Uh, and in fact, there is one right here listed in the gallery, and you'll notice that the gallery is split up into categories, okay? And in this particular case, the one I wanted is right here in the front, but if you were looking for something more particular, you know, like feature engineering, for example, or just a basic workflow, you can actually sub-segment the gallery into those categories. But this is the one we want, so we can actually just click on it and have a look at it. And because this one is shared freely, I can even see the source code that is defined in here, and I can see the inputs that it defines. So I can see that for inputs, it's going to require a data set ID and an N value, which is the number of features to select, right? This is, I can tell it I want two or three. And the objective field ID, this is a nice feature, right? Because when we're building the models, we need to know which feature we're predicting. And what we're going to get on the output is the list of the N selected features that were the best features. And I can see this is a Creative Commons v1.0 license. So this is this is what I want. So let's go ahead and clone this. All right, and I can just it's free, so I don't have to pay any money, which is always good. Excellent. All right, and it actually has taken me directly to the execution step. So I'm going to back up and just show you that this is now in my list of scripts. So this is the list of WizML scripts that are defined in my account, and here is that script that we just cloned from the gallery. Let's go ahead and try running this. All right, so we need to give it some inputs, and of course we need to tell it what data set we want. We need to tell it an N, uh, and we need to tell it the objective ID, which is the ID, objective field ID. So I need the ID, sorry. So the ID is 00008. All right, so there's my data set. We'll go with two fields. And we'll see if this works. All right, so this, what we're looking at now is the, um, uh, the execution window. So this is showing us the status of a WSML execution as it's progressing. I can see how long it's been running, the total number of resources have been created. If the script creates console output, it'll actually be listed down here in the console output. All right, so I can actually see this is long, it made its models. Uh, it's selected six as the first feature. Then it built more models and selected one. I can actually see a list of all the resources it created. So I can see it created two data sets, which makes sense because remember the best first does a training and test split. It created uh, 15 models and 15 evaluations. As so you'll remember, it creates lots of resources. In this case, it created a total of 32. Uh, and as you can see, it's now done. And in the output here, it's returned the two best features, which turned out to be the plasma glucose and the diabetes pedigree which is a measure of how much uh, the history of diabetes in your family. Okay, so this, this is a nice result because it, it matches our intuition uh, for you know, diagnostic measurements of diabetes, and it comes from the data. So this is, this is a, a nice example to look at. Now, this best first feature selection, this is something that I might want to run quite often as I'm experimenting with a new data set. Right? I might start with 100 features, and I just want to find the best 10, so I've got a, a little less complicated data set to experiment with. So because I'm running it all the time, I don't want to. I want it to be a little easier. I want it directly in the UI. So I can do this. I can come into the this little gear icon up here, and this lists all the different uh, resource menus, if you will. Uh, and I can actually come in here to the scripts for data sets, for example, and I can automatically see that it's detected that my WSML best first feature selection script is compatible with the data set UI. And I can just click on that. And now it's going to be in my UI. What does that mean? Let me show you. 
So if I go back to the dashboard now, if I'm looking at any data set, there's of course always a list of options, right? I can, uh, whoop, if I'm looking at a data set, I actually load the data set, sorry. There's a list of options, right? I can do a one-click model, one-click ensemble, etc. These are things I can do with the data set. And right next to it, there's this menu here, which is user customizable. And now here is my best first feature selection right in the UI. Okay, so you can imagine you can start building out these workflows and you can put them directly into the UI. All right, let's do another example. So for this one, I want to, uh, I don't want to build just a single model for this data set. I want to try doing the stack generalization. And so we'll go to the WSML examples. This is the, the GitHub repository that, that we've created here at BigML with some examples in it. And I can see there are quite a few in here, including, for example, gradient boosting, um, whether a model ensemble performs better, and here's some of the SmackDown stuff I was talking about before, and here's the stack generalization. So we click on that, I can see a very nice description of how it works, right? So it creates the uh, training and test set. Uh, it builds several different models. In this case, this one does a single tree, a random forest, a baggy ensemble, and a logistic regression for the stack of models. So it builds all four of those types for us. And this is a library now instead of a script. So once I have this library, this is how I execute it. I could just define something called a stack um, and call the make stack function. All right, we better do this. So all I need to do is grab this URL, and I'm going to go into the libraries now instead of scripts. And I'm going to import a library from GitHub. And I can just paste in that URL. It will fetch that resource. So I can verify the code looks correct, and then I can hit create. All right, and I can see the functions that this library defines. Uh, and among those is the make stack that I need to call. Now I need a script to execute this library. So let's create a script using the editor. So we'll go back to our scripts. And I will write a script using the editor. I need to include the library. Stack generalization, that's perfect. And the function I want to call is make stack. I'll actually just copy it from the readme, that's easier. And so here I can actually create my WSML script directly. Oop, now it's that one. We'll cut paste mistake. So this is the the uh, this script editor where I can write WSML scripts. In this case, all the script is doing is calling the function make stack from the library that we imported. And I'm defining this data set ID is going to be an input, uh, and this stack is going to be an output. So when I hit validate, it automatically detects that those are not defined and that they have those characteristics that one is an input and one is an output. But I still have to tell it what the data types are, what to expect as the input. So this data set ID, here's a list of possible values. So I, I want that to be a data set. And the stack, the thing that comes out, is a map type. All right, we can give this a name. We'll call it make a stack, for example. And let's create it. Okay, and again, once I create it, it immediately sends me to the input form where we can create an execution using this script. Uh, so let's go ahead and do it. So all I need to do is pass it the data set, and we'll let it run. Okay, and now it's going to go through, and it's going to create the model. It's going to create the two ensembles. It's going to create the logistic regression. Uh, and then it's going to build a final model using the batch outputs of all those models to build the sort of meta classifier, if you will. And again, we can watch it progressing. We can see it's built two data sets. So it did the training test split. It made a model. It made it two ensembles. There's the logistic regression. It's doing the batch predictions to create the outputs. And let's see if this one has a console output. It does. Nope. Uh, and here we get the list of resource IDs that it created for this stack. So those are the four um, resources that it created and the model, there's a meta model at the end that brings them all together. Okay, and if you look at the stack generalization library, there are functions that you can use to create predictions with this uh, stack generalization. Okay, let's say that uh, I want to show my best friend this really cool script that I just created. So I can come into the more, or sorry, the script, the script. So I can go to my make a stack script here, and I, I, I can add some details to it. For example, I can give it a description. Let's 
stacking is cool. All right, and then I can come down to the privacy settings, and if I just slide the secret link there, I can now just email that link to my friend, and he'll be able to uh, pull this script into his own dashboard. Or if I wanted to, I could just share it into the gallery. So I can set a price, whether it be free or all the way up to the uh, hundred dollars. There, I can set the license. Okay, so maybe I make this one free, and then I share it in the gallery, and I'll get a note back saying that's pending approval, and uh, we'll get notified that there's this new script to be shared. And again, we'll go through the review process and then make it available if it looks alright. All right, let's take a quick look at the the REPL. So in the lab section of the website where we're hiding lots of really cool things. We have the WSML REPL, and again, this will allow me to interact with the WSML language directly. So, for example, I can ask it for a simple thing like, what's one plus two? It will tell me three, that's excellent. Um, I can define functions in here, just like I could in a script. So I could define an addition function that takes as input A and B, uh, and returns the sum of A and B, okay? And now I can use that. I can say, okay, addition, 5, 2, and I get the answer 7. Um, but of course, again, what makes WSML powerful is that all of the BigML resources are first-class citizens, right? So I could say uh, list sources, perhaps. Okay, and there, those are all the sources that are in my account. Uh, if I just want to see the resource IDs, I can do that as well. So I can say resource IDs on this list of sources. So I just have the one source in my account and there's its ID. And I can even create a data set from this. I can say create a data set and I want to pass it as input a source and I want to use this source. Whoa. Anyways, it will work. <laughs> One more try. Here we go. Create data set source. That's the identifier for the data set I just created. So from this little interactive session, I actually just created that data set. So if we actually go back to the dashboard, you'll see that data set is now in my dashboard. All right, now of course this presentation has been an overview of WSML, and we know that there's a lot more you need to know to get started. And as such, we have a lot of online resources for you, including, of course, the API documentation, right? This will cover all of the details for how to interact with the API endpoints for scripts, um, libraries, and executions, uh, along with all of the possible parameters and exactly how to call it, right? It's very nice interactive documentation that makes it easy to see how to use it. We've also created a special WSML section on the website. You can see it's just bigml.com forward slash WSML. And this contains a high-level overview of WSML and links to several resources in there. So that's a, a nice starting point for finding everything that's available. And, of course, we've also provided extensive documentation, including a getting started guide, which will get you up to speed with how to work with WSML, a set of tutorials, which are very, very specific on how to create these workflows, and then, of course, a definitive reference manual for the WSML language itself. Now, if you're, if you're uh, not into the self-learning, you prefer a more guided approach to learning WSML, then we have prepared a series of four one-hour WSML training sessions to be held at the uh, dates and times that are listed here. And so in that first session, it will be an interview of, or <laughs> interview, an introduction of WSML, uh, but in much more detail than, than we've done here. And then in the advanced machine learning workflows, um, you'll start seeing a little more detail on how to use the WSML language with complex examples of you know, feature, advanced features in there, 
And then, of course, we have a, the language overview and workflows. Uh, and yeah, so this, this is a great series of uh, training sessions if you're interested in that. And finally, if you can only remember one, one resource, this URL, URL is for you. We have, um, this is the bigml.com forward slash releases. Okay, this is where we sort of announce all of the release, the, the latest release. And it contains all, links to all the information previously described, all of the documentation, and all of the descriptions of WizML are contained in there as well. All right, so where, where have we been on this journey? Well, we've seen that automation is critical to the fulfillment of the promise of machine learning, right? This idea that you can take data and magically turn it into insights. And, and to that end, we have created WizML, a tool which allows the creation of these workflows that can automate repetitive tasks, that can automate the model, tu model tuning and feature selection, and then can even combine machine learning models into more powerful models. And on top of all that, it can create shareable and reusable executions, which means that the platform gets more automated with every script written.